Yeah, it's, it's working. Start again. So here's the Gianta. We'll cover the scope, the reflected cross-site scripting, and large-scale scanning. We'll talk about WebSec Lab, test suite on the playground, cover scan with internal cross-site scripting scanner, mention Griffin for the first time publicly, and I'll talk about the fight for quality, the fight in false positives, and achieving accuracy with context detect, and conclude with the next steps, lessons, and summary. We'll focus mostly on reflected cross-site scripting and the server side, so some what comes from the server and the large scale in the context of the large scale and automated scanning. It's a easier part than maybe like the stored XSS or DOM XSS, but the idea is to focus on a specific problem and improve and learn and try to perfect it as much as possible. So cross-site scripting remains uh, in general and also for Yahoo a leading cause of incidents and also bug bounty payouts. You've probably seen this uh, uh, screen, uh, this page, it's from the AWASP top 10 and it says that pre prevalence is very widespread and I can only confirm that. Um, it says that detectability is easy and we'll We'll see about how like, uh, it's generally done. Large-scale testing, where, when you need to test uh, large properties so, such as Yahoo's, has unique requirements. One of them, that you have quite low tolerance for noise and false positives. Because if you have false positives, they don't usually happen once in a while that you can ignore or shut down. If you have certain types of false positives, then they start to overwhelm and pollute all the results and you drown in the noise. So you, are, you cannot find the bad needles among the straws that look like needles. And, um, and we, to scan large web, files, large web sites, it requires high quality automatic scanning and high quality means high accuracy. So first of all, it needs false positives to be low but we also want false negatives low, otherwise we don't find the real issues and developers get unhappy why your scanner hasn't picked up uh, what it could have picked up, theoretically. So we want to have the cake and eat it too. We claim that accurate detection of reflected cross-site scripting flaws is not yet a fully solved problem. But it all starts with tests. You need tests to be able to improve and check. And w when dealing with web security issues, you need frozen tests. You cannot wait for the right type of vulnerability to come up in production because it may take weeks, months, or even years. You still have to be prepared for this. And you need to model the previous cases, your previous experience, and be able to learn from your mistakes, uh, be able to take, for example, data from an incident and convert it to, to the test case that you will run on the current version or on the updated versions once you, once you change something. It's also we found that we needed a playground or what we call lab, so the environment that can be easily modified, changed, where you could tweak, share. And final purpose is documentation and communication, so you I work with my colleagues are all multiple time zones away from me. And when we discuss incidents or cases or improving scanners, it really helps to be able to pin down by name or by URL in a test suit a certain test, a certain class of issues or tests. So, and you will see that WebSec Lab, it helps to communicate also, for example, today. I can show you some things that would be difficult for me to show otherwise. WebSec Lab is based on multiple internal predecessors, so we always we've been dealing with issues with scanners. We wrote like sample HTML files, then sample PHP scripts, uh, then it was Node.js app, uh, but then when I discovered Go, it seems the perfect uh, tool for the test, was a pleasure to work with, was uh, compiled so you don't have typos. Uh, Go format, you should try that. If, if you haven't, it's out of this world. If you press save and it formats your code in a canonical, for, uh, canonical form that's the same for all the developers, all, even the 
outside of the company. So you don't have like huge style checks and uh, differences. And it's, it makes it easy to deploy. You don't need to application server. You don't need to think how to install Tomcat just on any, on any server, on any VM that you happen to work. You can put the binary or put like this go get and run this. So the cases are mostly reflected. I'll show it in a second. There are a few DOM XSS cases, but they're all real life cases. So it's not something that you're trying to come up with. It's basically, it's a collection of Yahoo XSS experience, at least reflected XSS experience from many years and from the scanners. One unique features compared to similar projects that is we put not only the real issues, the exploitable cases, we also put the false positive. So false positive that we had in our scanner that we had to fight, we thought that maybe someone else could benefit from this as well. So we learned from both kinds of scanning mistakes, uh, false negatives and false positives, because we want to improve on both of those areas. And I mentioned that it's easy to install. And for WebSec Lab, it's really, really easy. I, I don't think it can get any easier than that. So that it's open source on GitHub. You download the binary from the releases. You need to chmod it, well, at least on Mac. And that, that's it, you can run it. So uh, you don't have any runtime dependencies. You don't have to install anything else. What's really nice is that it will keep running as long as the processor architecture stays the same and operation system syscall API, but that doesn't change too often. So it can be running for years and years, and you can have run the same thing on Linux, on, on different flavors of Linux, on Red Hat, on Debian, whatever, whatever as long as it's uh, x86-64. So you will have it run on the local host. And I, I love this, having struggled with all the runtime errors and weird dependencies for many years of my career. Um, actually, before I go to the demo, another way, a kind of developer-oriented way to install the WebSec Lab is uh, Go Get. That's uh, I don't know how many of you have worked or try, tried Go. Okay, so there's a Go Get command that usually pulls the pulls the code from GitHub normally. So until Wednesday, the, the installation was Go Get, and then you need to set a few things. You need to install Go locally said go pass. It's not difficult. It, it's still. And then I was in Zap uh, developer meeting and picked up one of the guys as a guinea pig for to just to make sure how easy it is to install. And they went through this and they, it was easy, but there were still hiccups. Like you change, you switch to you switch to the different tab and you lose your go pass. It's not if it's not in your initialization. So I thought I'll make it even easier. So I made this like standalone binary release and it's on Git so there's nothing. Just download and you don't have to have Go installed on your host. So let's take a look at guys. Um, Um, well, it's uh, it's hard to see, but basically, it's a list of um, list of links with, with the cases. I hope that you try download and look at this. You could download it and play with this when you when you are flying back or riding home. So it's if it works locally, it doesn't need anything. So. Um, let's see. Um, and the README in the in in the project code, README has point of exploits URLs for most of the for most of the cases, and I, I usually use Firefox because then you don't have XSS auditor and uh, don't need to disable. So let's try a few ca cases. Let's see. So one is the text array injection, and you put the URL with close in text area and then the normal payload with image source and it gives a pop-up. Um, 
But I, I mentioned that there are also false positive cases. So uh, one of them is uh, this text area also. And yeah, I'm sorry it's small, but basically the, in this case, closing text area tag is filtered out. And you can see all this payload, it just normally entered in the, um, in the text area. And you cannot break out of the jail. You cannot break out of this text area context out of this box, so it's safe. And this, if the scanner flags this as, a, as an issue, it can be a problem. Maybe the developer has have real reason to present this uh, as in, in the text area, as long as the closing text area ends. At least in the modern browsers, I think with I, 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 Internet Explorer 7, it's different. Um, and the double encoded injection, um, it's uh, when you have payload encoded twice, like we encode URI components. So this would be encoded once, and this is twice with this telltale in 25, 22. So we have another case, and of course it fires. Um, and that's what the server response has this, uh, because it's, it happens sometimes on the server side if it passes through different level of APIs. Uh, or some function that get called that gets called twice and just unencoded twice. Injection to JavaScript blocks, so where you see the piece of JavaScript and the string, and it's taken from the in input parameter and insert and you're hacked. So you, it's because it's not quoted, so and gets inserted. The convention of WebSec Lab is that input is taken from the in parameter, so in for input. And there's a false positive that doesn't fire. And you can see that here the payload is the same, but it's, enclo it's uh, enclosed in the single quote, so properly quoted. And you cannot put a closing script tag or cannot put a uh, single quote because it gets, uh, it gets stripped away. You can see there's no single quote, so you stay in jail. You stay inside of that block. One unique feature of kind of what I, what I like of, of, of WebSec Lab is the dot OK cases. It works like this. If the pass, the URL pass ends with OK, then the framework switches to using HTML auto escape, so auto escaped HTML templates. That's based on the Go features. Go, Go feature. Go has text templates and HTML templates. And they work exactly the same except with HTML templates, you get context-sensitive context auto-escaping. So it analyzes the, um, the placeholder in which context they are placed and escape. So I copied exactly the same URL that I showed you earlier. Just it adds that OK, and you can see that it stays now all bound in, inside of text area. And if we look at the, at the source, uh, you can see that the framework escaped here the, with uh, the, the tag characters I escaped with HTML entities. And the same is with the JavaScript, so it doesn't fire. And you see that this alert, was what was unquoted injection, is now properly quoted. Uh, yeah, it shows single quotes. So I think this can be, WebSec Lab can also be used as educational Tool. So you could give it to your developers and say, well, try to play. Try to break all the get injection in all URLs that don't end with underscore FP. And then tell them about the dot OK URLs and show that. That's how it works if you are using the proper way, the content, context sense, uh, context out escaping HTML templates. And finally, because I'm paranoid, and that's something that we struggle with previous uh, uh, frameworks or cases, like we have a corp.yahoo.com domain, and you don't really want to run XSS in your, in your domain. So what is done with this framework, that whenever you get if like websitelab.corp.yahoo.com, the first thing the framework does, it checks if the host name is fully qualified domain name, it will convert it to IP quote pair and will redirect it so that you, at least it protects the cookies. Uh, you, you will not be able to, to exploit it. 
but I usually use it on, on local host. Uh, okay, switch back. So it's open source, and we would love more open source security projects and scanners to use it. And as well as anyone is, it's free, it's free BSD license and will stay this way. So please feel free to take it for training courses, for anything you might put it to good use. And we talked to, web, to Simon and the Zap team, and they want to use it for their web, for the OWASP Zap. CD testing once they migrate to GitHub and will work together so that I'm excited that it can help it, the project. In terms of the outsource outreach, uh, we try to look at several scanners and see what, uh, how it performed against WebSec Lab. So there were three issues for Arachne scanner. Um, one was segmentation fault on the resource splitting okay, because it was sending an invalid uh, response, HTTP response, uh, or something that is kind of considered invalid, and it broke the uh, Nokogiri pass, I believe. So it was quickly fixed. Uh, and then there were two false negatives on double encoded payload that you've seen and text error injection that you've also seen. So it, they got fixed. And for WASP ZAP, I created a few false positive and false negative issues. If you look at code google.com, PZAP proxy, it's with XSS in the, in the subject. So this uh, um, false positive is injection in the script, and it's, it's a tricky one. It's something that we suffered a lot, especially like if you think Yahoo search result pages. They, they need to take the user input, so they take the search parameter and they put it in different places, including in the script uh, strings. If, if they're properly quoted, it's no problem. But if, you, if the scanner doesn't uh, detect this, then it's, uh, it runs into difficulties and produce avalanche of the issues. And I also ran against W3AF, and it shows many underscore FP URLs, so I'm going to talk to project man members. It, it may be it's something that they would want to improve or change, or it may be a feature that they want to get as much as possible and uh, rely on human <coughs> and testers and people to analyze it. So scanners have different approaches, different philosophies, and uh, here the industry parallels the web, web, web application vulnerability scanner evaluation project, WebSAP. Google published a great, uh, some similar with more tests, uh, firing range. I wish it were in Go, in Go <laughs> for ease of installation, but there's also Grier and WebGo that are more education oriented. So I think it's best to use different ones and it's good to have multiple good test suits, especially if you try to evaluate commercial scanners to keep them honest so that they don't tune to the testing suit. It's also good to kind of customize the testing suit. So if you have uh, like a bug bounty issues or cases, uh, incidents, it's, we found it great to model them as, as a case and save them so that you would have it as an experience. Let's talk about the scanmus, uh, our existing or long-time cross-site scripting scanner. It was written by Rasmus Lerdov while he was at Yahoo, and it's a software that persisted for almost 10 years, a long time. At different times, we evaluated or considered to replace it with other open source options, or, but it's still working, and it's still it's a low-level scanner, but it still finds issues, so it's still useful. It helped to find many cross-site scripting bugs, and uh, many ex-Yahoo's asked me what would be the nearest equivalent, so it, it, it's being missed. In terms of internal, I give the simplified version. It's rather classical, a traditional uh, cross-site scripting scanner. So it has a set of tests with payloads, 
all were based on real issues and incidents uh, over the ma many years. Um, it's a, it has a request payload, sends it to the server, gets a response and has an expected either screen or regular expressions, and if it matches, shows a potential finding. Relatively simple. So, uh, here's a, one example, and it, you know, it sends the f script the tag uh, alert and expects this uh, uh, oops, sorry, stream and has some data. So here are some of the sample payloads. Uh, you can see the on mouse over injection into the uh, on, on handler with quoted and uh, unquoted uh, versions. JavaScript uh, handler with uh, the alert different types. This one, do you recognize what is this one? What does this one do? What is, oh, sorry. What are these 0D, 0A, 0D, 0A? Exactly, so that's the res response split in. And it's um, something that can also be used for the cross-site scripting. It's interesting that if, if you try is, uh, to scan this with Zap and one way to get familiar with WebSec Lab is just to run Zap scanner on this and see what it finds. So for this case, Zap flags cross-site scripting in, in this case, but it shows it's in the header. And it also shows it as a response splitting, but flags it as medium, uh, medium severity. Doesn't pick up yet, at least, that you could use the response splitting to kind of shift uh, this cross-site scripting payload from the headers into the into the body and execute it in the body. And finally, the very classical image: uh, was this closing quote or not? In Scanmos, the context adjustment. So, like figuring out where are you in the quoted segment or the JavaScript is done either with regular expressions or with some relatively hairy scripting logic. And you know, if you look at these regular expressions, and these are not the most complex, you can see that it quickly gets complicated and difficult to understand. And uh, it's, uh, it gets difficult to understand and to modify and to, to extend. So there is a better way that we'll talk in a few minutes. The problems with the Scanmos is a classical single-threaded, uh, no concurrency scanner. So partly it was done to, as, a, as a simple throttle to avoid overwhelming targets, like, like production ones. But without flexibility on that, it, some scans, if you try to scan like news.yahoo.com, it will take very long time, sometimes hours or even days. Even bigger problem was the accuracy. So with false positives, you had overwhelming noise and pages, uh, sometimes megabytes of, of the reports. The, 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 this were completely bogus, like the search results pages. And finally, the quality of findings and reports were difficult to understand because Scanmos, when just matching, it uses like a line-based matching. And if it finds the matches, it shows the matched line. It works OK for like a small cases and maybe previously, but now, because developers try to squeeze the last dip of performance and uh, sometimes like remove extra spaces. So the whole response is one line and if you get it in the report, that's very painful. Some of the ideas for solutions. So of course, a real developer, what you want to do if you have a problem, rewrite everything from scratch, right? Uh, we kind of delayed for different reasons, resource availability, but also wanted to investigate the problem with what we have and, and see the solution. So the first step we did was set up a relatively complete test suite, which was WebSec Lab. And uh, we separated crawler and fuzzer for, uh, I'll co come to this later. And in terms of accuracy, we knew that we had to brainstorm and figure out something on more accurate context detection that wouldn't involve even more complex regular expressions. And we'll talk about Griffin. Um, the company also had the whole Yahoo change direction and the new direction was launch velocity and continuous delivery. Launch velocity slogan is uh, 
commit to production with no human intervention. So you're supposed to have so many tests and such coverage that you can commit in source code repository and then the build pipeline takes this commit, builds it, runs all the tests, uh, unit test, functional test, puts it on staging, runs, uh, runs uh, test against staging, and if the test pass, it goes to the production service without any human intervention. But of course, that pre presents uh, challenges for security scanning. Uh, we're having hundreds of releases per day. I, I look at the griffin, so this uh, statistics, so the number of scans we do, and it's uh, basically several hundreds every day. I don't have an explanation why it's the peak in March. Maybe it's because the end of the quarter and people need to hit their goals and uh, get productive. So the Griffin has optimized crawler and smart deduplication so that we wouldn't scan like all the news articles. So if I'm skipping on this, I'll explain why. Um, it's also a framework to run multiple scanners, both internal and open source. It manages the distributed tasks, so it has workers um, that run the, those uh, plugins or scanners in parallel, and it aggregates the reporting. The current plugins are Scanmus, Taint and Phantom JS, it's a DOM XSS scanner that my teammates wrote, Arachne, Skipfish, and SQL Map. We like running multiple scanners so that we could benchmark them or cross-check them against each other and take the best uh, from each one. This is how the CD integration works. So you have commit, build, push, then you crawl and deduplicate, and the results of those deduplications sent to all different scanners. Griffin allowed us to do continuous CD-driven scanning, and also we now are less reliant on engineers doing scans. So previously we had to ask everyone, could you please uh, run the scanmus on your release? Now the releases happen all the time, but we rely on the, on the Griffin running scanners and we just look at the results. So, and we have also this scanmus arachne and skipfish. And it happens that uh, like we had some, when doing refactoring, then all of the sudden we had like scanmus didn't get the issue that was flagged by skipfish or arachne. There will be more information, which why I kind of cut and short on this. Uh, we had a uh, Griffin talk accepted to for WASP AppSec USA. So if you have a chance to go to San Francisco in September, you can learn much more about this. And uh, we, or oh, there will be videos. The problem was the accuracy of scanners. So this Griffin just ran the scanners, but it depends on them to to run the uh, to to provide quality results. So if, if there are false positives coming of scanmus, then they, they're still present in Griffin. And when you're trying to scan everything, do a large scale scanning with CD driven scanning, then you get overwhelmed with noise. So I was pushed by my teammates to do something and do something really quick. And this is how context detect was born. Let's talk about the context. Uh, the context, HTML context, is crucial for everything you want to do with web security. It's whether you want to do prevention, which is, like for example, the auto escaping templates that we showed is a great way to do this because it does it automatically, or for the detection testing. So let's consider alert document cookies in some contexts, if it's just like in a page by itself or between HTML, normal HTML tags, not, not strictly, it's, it's okay. So it's not, not to be flagged, no problem. If it's in JavaScript block, just an executable portion, then it's, then it's uh, in, injection, it's, it's a compromise incident. But again, if it's JavaScript, but in a properly quoted stream, then it's fine again. So you need to define that context. And Context is determined by the parser. So the HTML or JavaScript parser break source into boxes, into those units, uh, context units, where inside of the box you have the same processing and the user input. I think that's the crucial idea that the user input should be, never be able to get out of this box, get out of the jail 
and draw its own boxes and borders between them. If that starts to happen, then that's usually a problem and leads to compromises. So I have kind of a theory how injection detection should be done. There are two parts of this. One is the active content and JavaScript, uh, cross uh, CSS. Those uh, languages, they have, um, they have uh, regular grammar, so they're kind of more like normal languages. And if you put a bad, some like malformed string, it will break. Unlike HTML that really doesn't have a grammar, so it's uh, defined by the parser that will map up and fix any broken, broken input. So well, we can inject a breaker. Maybe you noticed that I, I showed like the alert uh, something and then opening open parentheses. So some JavaScript that is like not, not valid, unbalanced parentheses. And then we can check if syntax is broken. If so, then it's a problem. But the best way to do it is using a real parser, not regular expressions. And in HTML context, we can inject like A, B, C, where A and C are just markers, the identifiable string that wouldn't occur otherwise. And B is the context breaker. So it can be single, double quote, a tag, or even a space can be this boundary. So then we are checking. If A and C are in the same box, then, then we are good. Then user input is in jail. If A and C ends up to be in different boxes, then it means that B was able to draw a boundary and then we have a problem. And the real reliable way to do this is using HTML file parser. Go context detect, it basically follows this approach. It's, uh, it's a library for verification of uh, ScanMos potential findings and it uses Go HTML5 parser and the JavaScript parser from Otto, its name, Robert Kremen Otto. And we found them to perform very well, be very high quality software. And uh, since we need to kind of combine PHP and Go, we used the JSON bridge, not even protobuf, but that was okay because we have parallel execution and it's a local call, so it's very quick. So basically it's microservices architecture. So I think it's an, an idea worth exploring for the scanners having, for example, plugins, I asked that team, can we have plugins in different languages? To put it shortly, it allowed us to achieve practically zero false positive rates, which we were, ama we were amazed, we didn't thought that it was possible for, for the issues that we flagged. So like now for weeks, it stays quiet and the, the dashboards are usable, so we can actually see the, the real cases. And since we do more accurate detection, it reduces false negatives as well. So have your cake and eat it too. And we provided more meaningful findings message because we're based on context unit. Quickly, the next steps. I'm working as a side project or along other projects on a Go-based scanner that will implement this idea of uh, that I showed the context breakers and so on using experience from context detect and we'll be using and growing WebSec Lab tests. So if you have ideas what can be added, please let us know. Some of the lessons, so the scanner and tool is only good as, as it's test. So the test, you should be serious about test if you want to produce a quality scanner. It's worth to use multiple scanners to get the best of, of each and cross-check each of them. And you really need, and it really helps to use real passes rather than some kind of um, uh, uh, scripting logic or regular expressions for the accurate context-based detection and verification. And finally, I couldn't not put it there. So Go is an effective tool for large-scale server-side systems and for security work as well. So I encourage you to try this. In summary, we presented WebSec Lab, Foundation for Improving Scanning System, Griffin, which is framework for running multiple systems, CD integrations, there will be more information about this, and Context Detect, which, which uses Go, HTML5, and JavaScript Passer to practically I mean, eliminate known false positives. Thank you.
Any questions? Yeah, please. You ask about browser differences and uh, the detection. So the question is how the using HTML5 HTML5 parser relates to the real browsers and their differences in in parsers. The the modern browsers they are all based on HTML5 algorithm and they are quite similar in how they implement this and how they treat the that on the level of parsing HTML and JavaScript uh, CSS. So, so far we haven't seen yet many issues where like our detector would give one signal and we would find another one. So it's probably a problem. It's a problem if you, with the much older like Internet Explorer 7, so this, for example, text array doesn't respect this. Uh, so it's something that keep in mind and may, maybe needs to be adjusted. But uh, something that can be investigated. So if you find any cases that you think that uh, kind of HTML5 parser and the browser do pass differently, it's something to be considered. But in practice, we haven't found this to be a big, big problem and big issue. So I think HTML5 passing is one of the common denominators for the modern browsers. So the the Biden the count that the Biden needs to be taken in between HTML and JavaScript. I think it's it's an area for the for the future research. So maybe if you have a case that can, can show this or can demonstrate this, I'll be happy to add it to WebSec Lab so that everyone can play with this and all the scanners can take it into account. That's that's kind of the the approach that we follow: hit a problem, model it safe, and then solve it. Other questions? Yeah. Um, context detect is already part of the WebSec lab? Or is it a context detect is not, uh, no, it's not open source. The WebSec lab is just a set of tests. It's not a scanner. It's not, it's, it's not a library. So context detect is actually a relatively thin wrapper around the, um, the Go, Go parsers, HTML5 and JavaScript parser. I want to see if there's an interest, then maybe we, we could consider open sources or publishing some version of it. It's, there is nothing special. It, it's uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 400 lines of code or something. The question is, with PhantomJS being used by Griffin, uh, how, how it executes, uh, how it does the analysis, whether it uses the browser emulation or the active browser. So uh, painted PhantomJS is based on PhantomJS, and PhantomJS has the browser engine, the, namely WebKit. So it's actually loading the pages and it also, like for crawling, it tries to emulate the events so that it triggers all the JavaScript and do this. So it uh, needs more work, and, but it's also published. It's open source if you search for PhantomJS. If anyone wants to kind of test it or see it, it would be great. But it basically tries to emulate, you use it as a headless browser and uh, for crawling, it, it made great results. So it enabled to find like the, 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 all, all the nooks and crannies and uh, URLs related to 
event handlers. Guys will talk more about this uh, in September. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>